So thank you, uh, thank you for joining. So I will just let answer the guests because mainly they were waiting. They are waiting now. So we have first um, Martin Witte from Chief Sud. So hi, Martin. How are you? I'm Munia. I'm good. Thank you for hi. having me. And uh, you are calling us from Germany. Uh, I'm connected from San Diego today this morning, 7 a.m. So remote office today. So <laughs> yeah, well, that's yeah. actually yeah, yeah. Re remote work from the. It's not the surface beach, but uh, no, maybe <laughs> later today. <laughs> Great, and we have our second guest, which is Eric Volbrecht. Hi, Eric. Hello, live from Amsterdam, and just two days before, I was actually high fiving with Martin in uh, exactly. Arizona, around the corner of. Uh, the Rob's yeah. convergence, yeah. So I'm pretty sure I'm more jet lagged than Martin at the moment. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine? I wouldn't bet. <laughs> <laughs> so great. So thank you for uh, you for joining. Um, as you see, we have a lot of people that are already uh, joining with us, and uh, I mean, they are maybe really impatient to hear you about um, accessories to a medical device. Um, so for the people that are in the audience, uh, mainly you can ask your questions. Um, directly, and uh, if uh, we can feature that. Uh, I already have collected some questions from people because I asked that before. I tried to ask people to provide me some questions so that I can already uh, share that with uh, Martin and Eric. But don't hesitate if you have, if this doesn't answer your question, so then please uh, put that on the show notes and I will try to uh, to feature that and uh, and see uh, if our audience can, can answer to it. So, um, Martin, Eric, are you ready for answering the first questions? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> Let's go then. Let's go. So, um, I mean, the first one is an easy one, or maybe it will clarify a lot of things, which is uh, mainly uh, what is an accessory? So it is our, our, um, one of the, uh, of the, person, of the uh, person in the audience that asked that. What is an accessory? As there, are, there seems to be some confusion. So is there... For, uh, from your side, do you think there is some confusion and was there really some misunderstanding sometime on accessories here? Well, I, I, I'm going to quote a very wise man that was just speaking when we were not online yet. And he said, it depends all on the intended purpose. Okay. That's basically where it all starts, right? We have this, this uh, I mean, as a lawyer, I would always say, well, you always start with the law. We have a nice definition of, uh, of what's an accessory in the MDR, section 2.2. So that's, that's where you always start, I would say. And if you are unsure about how to apply a definition, uh, what I usually do is you dissect the definition into its different elements. And then you just look at your product and you decide, okay, do all the elements apply? Because it's that's how authorities look at it. That's probably how notified bodies look at it as well. And that's also how you can have a discussion with other people about to, to explain what your product actually is. So M Martin, if we look at the definition, so for you, what it is exactly, what's the difference with a, medi a real medical device then? An accessory, uh what is the difference with a real medical device in terms of the definition then? Yeah, I wanted to add something. So um, first of all, I think manufacturers need to be careful or need to be aware when they are using the term accessory. Yeah, because what I often see is that manufacturers use the term accessory for a medical device. Uh, so, but okay. they actually have a medical device and that is not an accessory. And what Eric is referring to, I mean, if you look into the MDR and you read, accessory for a medical device, then it makes clear that the accessory itself is not a medical device. So as, as Eric already mentioned, so if I now digest or put the definition into its little uh, sub elements, then I would first of all look what is a medical device and then the medical device definition is uh, the number one in uh, article two. And that has a lot of things, but there is one thing that makes it strange because it talks about um, 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 things that are alone or in combination used to uh, for a specific medical purpose. And now I think there at least the foundation for some confusion is. Yeah, on the one side we talk about accessory for a medical device, while it's not being a medical device itself, and in the division uh, definition of a medical device, it's something that is used in combination. And I think that a lot of 
uh, people get confused by that. And I, I would say I'm also sometimes confused with that. <laughs> okay. So we'll try, we, I hope we will try to find some kind of solution to, to put, draw a line, if I can say, between this mm -hmm. uh, and that. But um, maybe we'll see also that on, on the different questions we have. But um, clearly, maybe just as a shortcut to maybe a question that everybody is asking, um, what is, in terms of the MDR, if I classify it as a medical device or an accessory for a medical device, does it make really a difference for the EU MDR? Yeah, that, that, re that really depends. And I know you hate this question, uh, this, this answer from a notified body, but that really depends because there is one group of accessories which are very special and that's accessory to active medical implants, which are class three. And that doesn't matter what it is. Okay. They are defined as class three, full stop. Like, so, like if it is a cable or something or a charger or whatever that you need to charge the, the pacemaker or whatever, class it's three. It's a stupid little magnet that you use during ah, a, yeah, true. During a medical it. to switch off the ICD temporarily so it won't shock the implanting uh, surgeon. And just a stupid little magnet like that is a class three uh, uh, device under the uh, under the uh, MDR. That's uh, something that uh, caused really heated debate during the uh, during the stakeholder uh, um, consultation of the classification, the MDCG classification uh, guidance. And uh, yeah, basically they, they, they even put it in as a specific uh, example. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's actually hard to understand because currently now you have to justify why you should not do a, a clinical investigation with a very well understood magnet. Yeah, and, and this is um, the next question. So just maybe it could be a good transition here. So mainly how to consider then a clinical evidence or clinical evaluation for an accessory. So um, as we said, so the definition of uh, uh, the definition makes it an accessory or a medical device. Um, so it, there is this definition, and then there is a sentence within the MDR that says accessory or medical device or um, Annex 16 products are considered as medical device within the EU MDR. So it means that if I have an accessory, I have also to do a clinical evaluation or clinical investigation, or I mean, I have to follow the same routes here. So <clears throat> I think let's go first to where can I get clinical data from? Yeah, be Because there might be some accessories that have a significant impact on the clinical performance of a medical device. Yeah, And it might also be possible that an accessory can systematically break during a certain procedure. Um, and then I also want to do the post-market surveillance for that. But let's first of all think about where do I get data about the performance of that accessory from? And typically you wouldn't use the accessory alone. Yeah? Typically you will use it in the procedures where the, I will now call it main device, um, will be investigated. And you of course need to consider um, collecting data for these accessories as well especially if you want to certify them individually and also put them on the market independently from that main device. Because then you have a different thing and that needs to provide some evidence. Yeah, think for example, you have a drill bit for a, for, for, for a drill, for example, to, to drill uh, holes in bones, then the drill bit would typically be an accessory and the, uh, the drill itself could be a medical device. You can buy the drill bits uh, separately. And if you go to Martin with uh, uh, drill bits as an accessory, I'm pretty sure he will want to know a few things about how drill bits uh, work in the bone, uh, whether they don't splinter the bone, whether they cut correctly, uh, all that, all these performance related aspects. Yeah, exactly. So um, here, as we said, we have the accessories to a medical device. We have the medical device. Um, we need to collect data to prove that everything is working correctly and everything is matching. Um, as we talk, for example, about the drill bits, uh, these drill bits 
um, my company, for example, has is making those drill bits plus the drills, but they make five types of drills and one only type of drill bit. And then I'm, I'm, I, I'm, everything is compatible one to the other. Should I have clinical data for each of the drills with the accessories or one, uh, one clinical data for the accessories is fine for all the five drill bits, uh, drills? So, I mean, this yeah. is really the thing that makes a lot of confusion related to the data because at the end it's like, okay, I have some clinical data, but I made them with this drill, not this one or not this one. So should they have a clinical data with every um, medical device where they are used? Um, so let's, you can also look into NX1 and in NX1 you find that combination um, and accessories with the medical device, you need to show conformity that they are actually working together. And now to your question, I may ask a counter question. If you now have a drill bit and you have different drills and these different drills might have certain functionalities that an automatic stop mechanism, yeah, because the resistance changes, which the drill bit cannot recognize, but the drill can recognize. Now, the one drill is maybe cons um, intended to be used on the skull because you want to go to the brain. And the other drill is maybe used for, um, I don't know, a hip procedure where you see where the drill bit is. Um, if it's touching the brain or not might be very relevant. So I would actually want to see data that shows me that this functionality of the drill is performed uh, is supported by the drill bit. And that is, in my mind, that's logic from the risk management. I, I, I need to show that this combination works. Okay. Now I think it's a, it makes sense. Now, now let's say that all the drills are exactly the same. Can I make an equivalence to another drill and say then, all the data I got from this uh, one can be used also for the other one. No, not necessarily, because let's say, for example, you have one drill that is used for drilling into the skull, eh, let's say, but you have another extra high torque variant of your uh, of your drill for, uh, for uh, <clears throat> hip procedures, because you'll need a lot more torque to, uh, to drill there. Then, of course, the stresses that are put on the drill bit are completely different right? because for hip procedures, the stress on the drill uh, bit may be much more, much higher. So that means that you'll need to yeah, basically have data that covers both of these scenarios. So you cannot just say, oh, it's a drill. How complicated can it be? Almost no accessory or device is so simple that you can say that the data is very simple and fully generalizable to every intended purpose. No, it's clear. And um, so th this is, I think, uh, what is making confusion sometimes is mainly this combination of accessory and devices. It's not mm -hmm. maybe the accessory alone, because if you consider it alone, it's fine. We do what we try to do alone. But as soon as we are making this combination with the device, then this starts to be complicated because we say, okay, what should I exactly I have for the combination? Um, is it uh, fine or if I can say to have it uh, just for the accessory and for the drill separately, or should I have them combined? And should I have them for each version that I have of a drill, etc.? So this is this combination that makes it really complicated. Do you see the same, Martin, when you are maybe getting some submissions or maybe when your colleagues are getting submissions about that? Yes, yes. And what we, um, I mentioned that briefly, what we see often, and I think that is also something that is really problematic, um, there is sometimes an accessory delivered with the medical device. Yeah. And if we go back to the area of pacemakers, for example, typically the pay pacemakers come with a torque wrench because in, uh, in, in the header of the pacemaker, there is a little screw and I need to um, tighten that screw in order to fixate the connectors in that connect then the lead to the pacemaker and this torque wrench um, is delivered with the pacemaker, but you can also get the torque wrench individually. What often is not the case that the torque wrench as individual device is supported with the necessary evidence because typically that is not packed in the same way. That's maybe not sterilized in the same process. That is then not the same device because it's not a pacemaker. And that is often forgotten and uh, often these are not 
covered by the applications, nor are they covered with their own general safety and performance requirements checklists. And then we cannot certify that simple accessory, um, even though we can certify the pacemaker, but that is two different things. Yeah? The, the, the pacemaker is the pacemaker and the torque wrench is the torque wrench. And um, maybe this can also transition to this question here, uh, which is, is a medical device with its accessories considered as a medical device or is it a system? Because we have also this possibility of system, which are two different things in the same box. So before we talk about the torque wrench and the pacemaker and the thing, so are we consider that a, considering that as a system or not? Or, I mean, can we consider that as a system for when it's the same manufacturer who manufactures everything? So, and then if this is a system, does it need to fulfill all the requirements of Article 22? Uh, that's a nice question. I think that uh, it always helps to, uh, to, to look at the podcast video uh, of the two podcasts uh, we yeah. made one year about uh, systems and uh, systems accessories and medical devices. But I think this question, again, is an interesting one uh, in which the point that Martin made about colloquial use of the word uh, accessories is really relevant uh, here. Because normally, if, if you have a device and an, and an accessory, it's not automatically a system. Hmm. Certainly not. So, uh, because they are separate devices. And something does not automatically become a system under the MDR. That is not possible. Because Article 22 requires that there is a specific economic operator being the person referred to in Article 22, Section 1, yeah. that says, I have several products here, which can be medical devices, which can be accessories, can be IVDs, can be accessories to IVDs, can even be non-MDR or IVDR products, which I put together and I assign a meta intended purpose to this set, to this system, which has, uh, uh, which is compatible or in scope of all the intended purposes of the devices in or other products in the system. So you really need an active step. And in order to place that on the market as a system, so you also have to sell it as a system. And as long as you don't do that, then it's not like uh, if you, uh, if you uh, shoot the, the Terminator, the liquid Terminator, the, everything automatically goes together and becomes a system. That's not how it works with devices and, uh, uh, and medical devices. So the fact that to go into the technical documentation, uh, uh, the fact that you refer from the technical documentation to accessories or other devices as being compatible with them does not automatically make them into a system. No, it's, uh, it's clear. And um, um, Martin, have you, I mean, for example, for some cases, so have you had, if I can say, those cases where we have those uh, accessories and those medical devices packed together or made, made like a system? And um, in, terms of, in terms of that, so was it like confusing also for notified bodies to receive that when maybe it should have been a full medical device by itself? Mm, yeah, I think that I'm... Not, me personally not, and uh, especially in that uh, active medical implants field, it's, it's, it's not that often, but it might happen in other areas like orthopedic or cardiovascular devices or even with, with totally different devices that, and this question comes up, but um, as Eric already mentioned, it is, um, it is really what, you, what you're putting together and how you're defining it, and it's very important how you put it into your application and how clear you make it for, for us as notified body what you want to get certified in the end. And um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm often seeing, or I remember seeing syringes which were packed with uh, catheters and with um, all these things. But yeah, I, I wouldn't have a good example in mind right now. Okay, no, it's great. Um, okay, we have also uh, another question here, which is accessories for a medical device are provided together with an MD. Uh, and provide independently too. So in this case, do we need to submit accessories separately so for uh, to the notified body and also um, have them together, so have a C certificate together also. So here, is there some kind of strategy that the companies 
have to approach, I can say, to make it um, optimized and efficient. Or here they have no choice, they have to submit a medical device in one side, or accessories in the other side, and not together. Yeah, as I already mentioned, uh, accessories, when they are actually medical devices, then you need to go for independent conformity assessments in the worst case. Um, but in, in, in really the worst case, it's two different technical documentation. So to, to different and is there, because at, the, at one point you have to link them also. So you yes. have to show that this is, com this is working one to the other. So exactly. I think it's, it's, it's many that the, the point is to say, should I have also, a, I mean, should I maybe discuss on each of the files to say I am compatible with this and the other we are compatible with this, or it's like it's better maybe to have one file for everything. Yeah, I'm. I, I, I am a big supporter of not having one file for everything. Okay. Okay. Um, and now a lot of people in the audience may think, "Hey, what is he talking about?" Of course, we do one file for everything because we did it all the time and it's easier. And we don't want exactly. to create so many technical documentations. I get that. But in the very moment where one of your elements can be used with several other elements, you will not be able to keep up your technical documentations. And I did that in the past. So I did create technical documentations for accessories and it was really useful to have them separately from the pacemakers and not to repeat every time in a pacemaker submission the information for a talk wrench. Uh, that, it, that makes sense. So it is not useless to split your portfolio wisely when it comes to accessories. But if they are putting that together, <clears throat> uh, will the notified body have any comments to it? Or it's not preferable, but it's not like... I, 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 had, the, I had the very same question uh, two days ago in Phoenix. And um, if you put it together and you make it clear for the reviewer what evidence belongs to which part of your whatever term I now use, combination of things, <laughs> uh, then it's good. Okay. It's okay. You need, to, you need to put yourself into the shoes of the reviewer. Do they understand what you want? And if you just mention somewhere in your technical documentation that yes, these uh, accessories are also separately available, then that does not automatically mean that they are certified or they are covered by your certificate. So you also need to check the scope of your certificate you need to check the um, devices you have in the list of devices. You need to check um, what have you put into your application. You cannot just make the statement they are also separately available because that can actually have a big impact on the conformity assessment. Okay. Um, uh, just checking because I look at how we have some good questions here. Um, I saw Shata that is asking if we have to register together as a system. I mean, we just talked about that. Uh, taking the, uh, Elizabeth has a nice, difficult question. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> more of a political question, I would Which say. Which one? <clears throat> it's the one on uh, uh, on um, why. Uh, what is behind the or or why? How <clears throat> the basically, it's it's about the policy behind the classification of torque wrenches uh, and and other. Uh, accessories to active implantables as class three. Uh, should I put it? Is the one of Elizabeth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want me to place it so like you can answer to that? Well, if Martin can't, I can because it's it's basically uh, it, it's the it's the position that the uh, that the NDCG took uh, on this, uh, and you can, uh, di agree or disagree with that position. I mean, I, I vehemently disagree with it because I don't think it's logical. On the other hand, I've also had discussions with the commission that were saying to me like, uh, Hey, you're a lawyer. Can't you read? It literally says that in the law. So what's your problem? Right. <laughs> and this is, this is in the end, since the MDCG unfortunately lined up on a position, which I think you cannot defend systematically and based on the intention of the law, they are of the opinion that you can defend it based on the literal interpretation of the law. And they and, and the member states that notify the notified bodies apparently have instructed notified bodies 
to take that position uh, and and maintain that. That's uh, that's that's unfortunately as simple as that. I think. Yeah, thank you, Eric, for these uh, for putting this into perspective because it is actually really not our decision and definitely not mine personally wow. because I actually have the same concerns and considerations as Eric has. However, if that's the interpretation of the MDCG and of our authority, then I have limited chances. I can actually go into a dispute with the manufacturer and we can fight that in front of court against the authority or the manufacturer against us because we have to stand with the authority's interpretation of it, if we like it or not. And then a court can decide. The question is if that's really worth the effort. And if it is, then I would encourage everybody to go this way. Um, but um, yeah, it, I, it's, it, I don't make my opinion myself and I'm tied to these um, guidances. And also among Team NB notified bodies, we came to the conclusion that yes, if the situation is as it is now, then we have to follow it. So it's no, not it's, a yeah. position, it's a Team NB plus MDCG plus a local authority position. And um, if we like it or not, that's, that's, that's secondary. Yeah, I, I think this is important to mention because sometimes yeah, people or manufacturers are attacking the notified bodies and saying uh, why this, why that is ridiculous, etc. But at the end, it's not your decision. You are just applying what 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 you're asking you to do. So, but I, I would also I would do the I would would do the very same. I would, would do the very same. But yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, I people often tend to forget how much uh, mandatory instructions notified bodies get from yep. their notifying authorities in the background. No, it's clear. So yeah, don't fight with your, against your notified body. Go within the commission, the NDCG or anybody else. But yeah, <laughs> just applying the rules. Um, OK, another question here. Um, uh, if possible, thank you. How can we distinguish an accessory from a product from general laboratory use, which I suppose it's IVDR? Mm -hmm. How can we determine uh, then? How can we determine uh, if a standalone software with medical device purpose is an MD or an accessory of an MD? So, who wants to take that? Oh, these are two, two very different questions. Yeah, two different questions. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that a product for general laboratory use does not have an uh, a product for general laboratory use does not have an intended purpose as a device. And I think that what the question does, it, it misses the point of uh, intended purpose, because that's that's the whole difference. If you have a product for general laboratory use, it would be, for example, a general microscope, right? You can enlarge things with it. But if I would say, for example, I have a, uh, a, a microscope that is specifically intended to count cells for particular in vitro diagnostic procedures, then I have a product for, uh, then I already have a, a, a microscope in scope of the definition of, an, of a device. And if I would say, well, the microscope is to be used as an accessory to a particular assay, because otherwise you cannot make the de determination uh, because you have to count cells within a particular surface like they would do in the really old days. Then, uh, then you could say, okay, now I have an accessory. Okay. Um, let's and the standalone on. software part, or do you want to go further there, Monia? Oh, no, I was leaving that for you, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> so how can we? So that's the standalone software with medical purpose is a medical device or an accessory of a medical device. Well, if the so the standalone software has a medical purpose, it's a medical device. Yeah, easy. <laughs> yeah. And that medical device can be used with another medical device, but then it's not an accessory. So. Mm, okay. Okay. Follow you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's what I said. Yeah. It is, by definition, an accessory according to MDI is everything but a medical device. Yeah. And if my software is standalone software, so there is a standalone software that has its Basically, the IDI it has its uh, medical purpose, so the software is a medical device, no question. Yeah. And now I use the software in, 
maybe that software that I can put on my computer that runs an MRI scanner, I can purchase individually, which I don't think is the case, but maybe it is. Uh, then the combination of two, these two medical devices needs to work properly and needs to show its performance, but both are individual, independent medical devices. Um, okay, um, maybe link to that for the software, this one, which uh, try to also ask if uh, some software automatically or modules of software are automatically a medical device. So if a specific software module is considered a medical device uh, software, does that mean that other modules that facilitate the use of said medical device software module automatically are an accessory example in the case of a risk calculator for cardiovascular disease that is called by a hospital information system? Is there a scenario in which the hospital information system is an accessory uh, of the medical device software for the MDR point of view? I suppose when we talk about OP hospital information system, it's like just a software managing the data in the, in the hospital, I suppose. Yeah, I st if you suppose that, that's good. But maybe the hospital information yeah. system does something with the data. Because exactly. we have the MDCG that talks specifically about exclusion of those kind of system that uh, are just yeah, here yeah, to yeah, 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 data. Yeah. But there might be, and this is interesting. So maybe in your, um, in, in, in your network or in your system, hospital information system, there is a module that reduces the, um, the size of a X-ray image. Okay. So that it's not, I don't know, two gigabyte, but only two megabyte. Example of an accessory I found once in a hospital information system. Uh, that was, uh, the, so the hospital information system had, uh, had a little module built in in which you could uh, define control blocks for the uh, for a kidney dialysis machine and then upload them to the kidney dialysis machine directly. Now then, <laughs> this is a scenario in which your uh, hospital information system definitely qualifies as an accessory. There's basically no way of talking yourself out of it. But in this case, the question is about modules. And people that have questions about modules, I would say go back into the MDCG 2019-11 uh, guidance, where they discuss, I think it's chapter seven, where they discuss uh, modules, and where they definitely do not even imply that a module would automatically be an accessory. It can be that a module fulfills an accessory uh, function for sure. Eh? Let's say, for example, you have a module that a program that that you can use to uh, program a medical device with, for example, just like uh, uh, just like uh, with the kidney dialysis machine I just gave. But um, it's definitely automatic because uh, whenever people pose questions like, uh, um, it, uh, uh, yeah, does this automatically mean that, then it's usually where you really need to think about whether it's as automatic as you think. Yeah, uh, exactly. And um, yeah, as, as you've said, the MDCG guidance is providing some, some hints here. So maybe uh, to go there. And this question of software um, is coming always. I mean, not only for accessory, but for everything. Is this a software as a medical device? Is a, so this is something that um, it's, I think, adding confusion, if I can say, when we add the, the accessories also to, to that, but mainly follow the definitions. And I suppose that you will find, find the answers, but I, I can understand the, the, point, uh, the point here. The idea with modules is that the modules are definitely not automatic, automatically also in scope of the regulations. Because Martin just kept saying, uh, everything that is not a medical device is an accessory provided that it is in scope of the regulation. And this modules, uh, the modules part of the guidance basically says, well, you as a manufacturer, you define what is the device, but you carve out which models are not the device. So that's, that, is, that is how the logic uh, works there. Okay. Um, so another point, which is also interesting because we had already this question from, from other customers. So if an accessory specifically, specifically enables the medical device to be used in accordance with its their intended purposes, how do you differentiate it from a component or spare part, I suppose, or elements that are inside of the medical device itself? Because I suppose we also say that the component is also enabling the medical device to be used in accordance with its uh, intended purpose. 
I mean, we go far here. It's really great. <laughs> oh, it's a really nice and super relevant question, uh, I think, actually, because how you di differentiate it, you look in the technical uh, documentation of the device, because the technical documentation of the device will list the components. And if it's a component that's supposed to be inter uh, interchangeable or replaceable, uh, uh, after it's worn, for example, then it will list that as a component. So that's usually a good place uh, to start. And I think where it gets really tricky, if you are going into the Article 23, Section 2 type of components, so those are typically the components that add additional uh, functionality to the device or change the risk profile. Uh, and these, these are the things where you can definitely have the discussion uh, because that, those are actually a device by themselves. That's also what the MDR says. So they could, yeah, theoretically be seen as an accessory uh, then. Yeah, something because about what, here. What else would they be if they are a device, but they're actually a component, right? That's something that the legislator didn't think about very, very uh, no. into yeah. great depth, I think. But they would almost automatically be an accessory then. Okay, um, next one uh, about the difference between uh, labels in the related to the accessory. So are we putting the same label for an accessory and a medical device? Is there any difference? Can we distinguish on the label that this is an accessory and this is a medical device or something like that? Well, if the accessory is going through a conformity assessment, then you will, in my understanding would be you will not under, uh, see a difference there. Yeah, I mean, to be there will be this empty symbol also, because as we said, it sees a medical device uh, per a UMDR. Um, I suppose then the same let, let's, let's, let's use maybe an example that is very obvious. Okay. I have an active medical product that has this, um, this uh, three pole connector in the housing of the active medical product. And then on the other side, you have this, uh, in Germany, you have this big round um, connector that is round and that also has a round. Um, now that cable is a standard cable and I need to replace it, I might just go to a store and buy a cable if that is actually allowed for the medical device to do. So I would buy a cable and on that cable, there is no medical device symbol because it's not a medical device. And that's typically a cable that is not intended to be used with a medical device by definition, but it's the same cable. Or other way around, it's not intended only for a medical device. That's the point. Yeah. Just the standard cable. So um, the, I mean, as we said, so we can have the same device that is intended for medical device and not intended for medical device. It's, uh, so then at the end, that's we have, also possible. Yeah. That's so, also uh, possible. Yeah. In that case, we just have to prove that one is, up, I mean, is, 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 uh, can be connected to the other. So many that they are compatible and it's mainly yeah. that, that we have to prove on, on, on making this, but, um, um, yeah. So. Yeah, if it is a consumer product, then it's of course not a medical device, but when it's used with a medical device and also assessed with a medical device and it's only intended to be used with a medical device, then the requirements of the MDR apply. Uh, okay, so just a question from Christian, but it's exactly what you've said. Um, so can an accessory be a medical device? Uh, we said that if it's an accessory, per definition, this means it's not a medical device. So yeah. mainly this is the definition that is really saying that. But exactly. as we said, the EU MDR consider the accessories following the same path as a medical device. So it's not like yeah. there is different. This is, I think, what makes the confusion because uh, in the it says um, an accessory is considered as a medical device when in reality the definition makes it not a medical device. But this is yeah. mainly uh, the, the point here. Yeah, as a okay. non-lawyer, I'm also wondering if one could put this in easier terms, but maybe there's reasons why it's so complicated. Possible. <laughs> <laughs> of course, not possible. <laughs> uh, just quickly, if we come back to the questions from some of the people um, uh, before. So, uh, are tied down for wheelchair an accessory to the wheelchair or to the vehicle? Uh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, I mean, how... Because this is this is a question by function, 
But that's not how you determine if something is an accessory or not, because you determine it by intended purpose. So, uh, yeah, it depends on what the intended purpose is of this. Is this to hold 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 a wheelchair in? Is this? Uh, let's say you sell these, um, and you say, well, these are these are uh, uh, these are tie down. Uh, this is a tie down apparatus for securing load in the back of a van. Yeah, then it's definitely not not an accessory to a wheelchair. But if you uh, if you start looking at okay, this is uh, if you start specifying it, this is uh, specifically for securing wheelchairs. Then you would still need to argue how this is specifically assisting the intended purpose of the wheelchair, of the medical intended purpose of the wheelchair, and that's actually. Uh, yeah, not completely evident, uh, I think. Because okay. is, the, is the medical intended purpose of the wheelchair to be fixed in the back of a van? Probably not. Exactly. I mean, I mean, uh, as we said, we have really to go to again intended purpose. What is it for? What is? It, why is it working uh, exactly? And this will then fall under the medical device definition or not, or then also the accessory definition or not for a medical device. <coughs> Um, let's come back to another question here, which is this one. I'm curious about EU UDI for systems that incorporate a variety of medical devices or accessories that are compatible with other systems, especially when you have configurable systems sold as such. In each configuration, its own device um, with its own UDI, or you will, will you want to separate each accessory device that can also be sold separate when it's sold as a configured system? Because here, yeah, when we have the technical documentation, we are writing what are the variants or the configurations that are need to be used. So here, um, do we need to have one UDI for each variant configuration or one for each uh, element? I mean, how, how do you see that? Or maybe uh, an advice for, for how to make it better also for the regulators to read that? <laughs> That's what I think when I read Annex 6 as well, uh, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the answer I, to the question. <laughs> yeah, no, the answer to the question is this is a very theoretic. I, I get that this is a realistic problem, a re yeah. re real problem. I, I totally get that. Um, but what is to what is important in these complex questions, and for me this is a complex question, is to actually look at the case and to decide how things work together how things can be grouped together, what cannot be grouped together. I, I dare to give a general response to this one. Yeah, no, yeah. but I, I agree. What, what I can say is, of course, there, um, so there is, there is, guy, there is, uh, there are rules on configurable devices, for example, in NX6, right? So you can follow those. This question also, again, uh, and in that sense, it's a good question. Also, again, goes to the uh, to the to the systems problem that we discussed earlier, right? Where because it goes to configurable systems, there is also guidance on when uh, how to group systems together in Annex Six as well. So it's really as Martin says, you have to determine what am I? Am I compatible devices or am I a system? Or uh, what exactly am I dealing with? And also specifically how do i want to group it in the end you have to think for udi you have to think in terms of uh, traceability how will somebody know that this is the uh, the specific version of the um, of the uh, uh, a specific version and a specific iteration of that version that will be relevant in per, in, in uh, terms of traceability because that's in the end what it's all about yeah, no, I can I can see that. So yeah, sometimes yeah, the, the, we have some real cases and and, and the ideas many to look also at at each of the elements of it to be really providing the right answer. But here, I, I think it was uh, it was clear now. Um, an easier one. Any guidance on accessories to Annex sixteen products? Ah, the guidance for Annex sixteen products would be good in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe some common specifications for those. So, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, guidance. 
basically when I was uh, when I was looking at this, I mean, you can you could argue that based that uh, on based on the way these products are defined, their accessories are outside of the scope of the uh, of the MDR. That's basically uh, the implication of how the system is set up. But I don't know if, for example, notified bodies already have received orders to <laughs> include them anyway. That's uh, that's something I don't know. But basically, the way that the law is written, uh, accessories to uh, to NX16 products are out out of scope of the uh, of the MDR. I can't yeah. add anything to that. So, um, <laughs> okay. But right. but so I can ask. I, I can actually. How this maybe. develops because there is so much unclear about uh, about NX16 products. I mean. Maybe the wise people in the NDCG will decide tomorrow that they want them in anyway, and then we get an NDCG guidance, and Martin and and the other notified bodies are instructed uh, against all logic to include it anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And when I'm thinking of an NX16 product that can also be a medical device, and that does not have a medical purpose, let's think about a hair removal laser. And let's think about a laser that has accessories that is used for medical purposes. And now you have a laser that is used for a non-medical purpose. Both have accessories, maybe the same. <laughs> yeah. why, why would you treat them differently? Yeah. So that's open. That's totally open. OK. Um, when the accessories, uh, when the accessory is manufactured by another company that does not require to be MDR, how can we apply the rules for MDR labeling when we are not the legal manufacturer? When you are not the legal manufacturer, why would you want to force the other manufacturer to label it as a medical device? Are you, what I, I, I do have an idea what's yeah. happening here. Yeah. I think there is a thing, there is an article that is bought by the other company. So the other company is a supplier for an article that uh, Marie's firma uh, company is using to put into or to provide with a medical device. So yeah, it's like something like OEM. The cable example that you just gave, uh, Martin. Yeah. Say again? Like the cable uh, example. That yeah, you the cable. Exactly. And now, what do I do? I either as a legal manufacturer use this supplied article and put it on the market myself as a medical device then i'm also the legal manufacturer but i just get the component from somewhere else the article itself but i'm responsible for its uh, conformity or i'm just referencing it and when that other article is a standardized article that is either way available, I wouldn't see a big problem that it's not a medical device labeled thing. But when I use it, the article with my medical device and put them on the market together or separately, then I, as the legal manufacturer, become the legally responsible person for that article I acquired. Yeah. And it might actually, in the case of cable, it might also be included in the yeah. medical device uh, as such. So that and so, we are looking at use of the word accessory in the colloquial meaning again. Okay. If we would, we would look at it as a typical uh, OEM manufacturing question, as as Martin answered, yeah. Then uh, then if you are if if you are the OEM, yeah. Well, you don't have to do anything. But if you are the the person placing the uh, the OEM produced part on the market in scope of the MDR. As an accessory, then yeah, then then it's really simple. Then Article 10 applies. Article 10 8 says, okay, you are uh, you are responsible for the full technical documentation. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And don't justify that you don't have access to the data because the supplier doesn't want to give you the data. That's on drastically said. That's your problem. Exactly. Yeah. And you have I mean, to require. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, we talked about that with OEM, OBL. It's not existing anymore, if I can say. We have now to go to manufacturer-supplier relationship uh, instead of that. So that you are clearly the legal manufacturer. You are placing the device on the market. So you should take responsibility for everything that is included on your pack. Uh, so if it is not a medical device, if it has no medical purpose, if I can say, 
then uh, you cannot just place it on the market like that without uh, making, if I can say, I mean, without placing yourself the, the if I can say, the, the claims for your company that you are placing that as a medical device uh, on the market. Uh, another question, uh, if you want to collect safety and performance data for an accessory, is it needed to correlate the data with each intended purpose the accessory was used for? I think we have the same for medical devices, so here is just a question for accessories. But I think the answer is the same, suppose, I suppose. So we talked about this drill bit in the beginning, right? Yeah. Even though people seem to hate the drill bit. Uh, I saw that also, yeah. <laughs> what, they hate the drill bit? No, they, they say that the drill bit is not considered as an accessory, it should be considered as a medical device. Itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was thinking about the same thing, but it doesn't okay. really matter. It's just a very uh, good example, but it's true. Yeah, it drills yeah, yeah. holes in two bones, so it's a medical device. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, the, the, if there is a medical device for the for which I need to do post-market surveillance and I need to collect safety and performance data over the lifetime of the device, then I want to collect the data for the covered intended purpose. If now I do that for an accessory, I give that to the lawyer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean for the I mean again I would say look at the look at the definition of accessory, right? So what kind of what kind of accessory are you? Are you a an accessory that enables the intended use of the medical device? Or are you an accessory that specifically and directly assists the intended medical the medical functionality of the device, a medical device in line with its intended purpose? In both cases, there is uh, a very strong correlation with the intended purpose of the uh, of the medical device. So that that also means that yeah, uh, everything you would do because that's actually the whole idea behind an accessory would be uh, in light of does the accessory indeed uh, accessorize the intended purpose uh, the the medical device uh, correctly? So that means that yeah. Um, uh, and if you have multiple intended purposes, yes, of course, you need to have that for every intended purpose. So if we would go back to the drill bit, uh, uh, if you say I use it for, uh, let's say, high torque and low torque drilling, then uh, you would need to have data uh, for, for both of these intended purposes. Right. Um, so we are arriving to the end of, uh, of this uh, live session. Mm -hmm. um, you who, I mean, there are still some questions so to, to look at them. Um, the just wanted maybe from your side, Martin, and maybe from your side, Eric, um, also that you maybe give a last advice or maybe a last thing to say about accessories. Because as we said at the beginning, sometimes manufacturers are overthinking. So how can we help them to not overthink here? I think there's two, two things are important. First, really think about the intended use dash purpose of the article that is in front of you. That is the very first thing you need to do. And the second thing is, what is the consequence of naming something accessory or medical device? Uh, and those are linked together. Yeah, If your intended purpose clearly makes it a medical device, just forget about the accessory discussion because you it's just a waste of brain capacity <laughs> and uh, and money and yeah. uh, if if your intended purpose is vague maybe it's good to make it clearer because if you are really the maker of that thing then you are able to do that i mean we we, we as we said so um, be sure that if your product has a medical purpose then it cannot be an accessory so and if it has not and it's helping another medical device then it's an accessory but at the end if i can say you should we should try really to uh, streamline that and not overthink this kind of thing because at the end an accessory for a medical device has to follow the same route as a medical device so at the end you have to get a technical file and get everything yeah. for it and as you said avoid combining everything try to make it separate so that it's a uh, it's easier for, 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 for even the regulators, but also for them. Um, Eric? Yeah, I think what 
my advice is a bit uh, connected to what Martin uh, said. Uh, basically, my advice is words have meaning. That's why we have defined concepts in the MDR. Uh, and as a, a slightly autistic lawyer, I'm always really annoyed by the confusion that people create by not referring to defined concepts as defined concepts. I mean, there's no better way to make things complicated for yourself than using a defined term not according to its definition. So, uh, as, so we've been discussing about using the word uh, accessory in the MDR context colloquially. It's just really, it shows that your regulatory affairs people lack training or lack awareness of that there are defined concepts. So my advice is to really start again by reading the definitions in the MDR when you are dealing with, uh, with concepts like this and work from that. Because most of the really costly mistakes I see clients make is that they don't understand that these definitions actually have meaning and without and, and if you misapply the definitions, for example, by referring something colloquially, yeah, that gets you in trouble. It propagates, and before you know it, you've got completely mischaracterized products in your portfolio, which can be costly, because if you are placing products on the market that are that you think are not an accessory, but you do refer to them as accessory in your documentation, and then your competent authority starts uh, starts enforcing against you because yes, you say it's an accessory yourself. So where's your technical documentation and CE marking? It just gets you in trouble. So be precise about your words. If something is blue, then call it blue. If something is green, call it green. If it's a medical device, call it a medical device. If it's an accessory, call it an accessory. But think about it, why you do it, as Martin also said. Yeah. Great. No, really, thank you, and uh, got a lot of messages. Who thanks? Thank you for this session and the amazing advice that you are providing. So, really, thank you. I hope this will clarify more uh, about the accessories for a medical device. But um, I will try to go through the question here on the on the chat and try to answer if there are any others, any other question that we can answer. Uh, but don't hesitate to also um, answer the question yourself. If uh, other people uh, see the, the question and, and they know the answer, please help also the others to understand understand well, that. I want to give a shout out to uh, to uh, to uh, Pascal Wettstein for this fantastic MDR movie that he posted uh, of the boxing match. That is just absolutely epic. If you don't okay. know it, go look for it. It is so good. <laughs> No, I, I don't know it. So yeah, if if can it's someone a real can, story. if someone can post uh, on the on the on the chat, I can say the link will be really great. Hilarious. Post it in the post it in the chat, uh, Pascal. It's just great. Fantastic. Okay, so thank you uh, everyone. Thank you for joining. Sorry that we couldn't uh, go through all the questions, but uh, I hope yeah, ma in majority we are giving you some some advice and some links where where to go. And thank you for you, Martin and Eric, to for coming and answering all that. I hope yeah you also enjoyed the session and enjoyed the question because as I said, we are receiving as also consultant, we are receiving all those questions, and sometimes it's also a bit tricky to uh, to answer that. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you for that. Okay, so I wish you a nice weekend because we are Friday now. So nice weekend uh, to everybody, and then uh, I will post this video on the YouTube channel as a replay next week. So. Uh, if you have missed the session, so you can still uh, tell people that uh, this will be posted next week. Okay, thank you everybody, and I wish you a nice weekend. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.